Tamara Cribley from the Deliberate Page. Welcome to the Rocky Mountain Writer Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great to have you on. I know you were a presenter at the Colorado Gold Conference this year, one of the few conferences I've missed in the last decade or so. But um, sorry, I didn't get a chance to meet you there, but it's great to have you on and find out more about your services today. So thanks for your time. My pleasure. It was a great experience. Was that your first gold? Uh, it was, actually. That's the first time I've been at that conference. And what'd you think? Um, it was really well organized, and it was a, a fantastic mix of people. Um, a lot of the conferences I go to are romance writers, and so it's a very different audience. So it's a need to see the different, um, the different genres and the different, even the different age groups. There are a lot of younger and older people that I'm used to seeing. And so you do get around to other conferences, it sounds like. I do. Yeah. 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 Cold Gold is a total mix of everybody. <laughs> so it's a nice, it, that, that's a fun, fun aspect of it to see all these different groups kind of network and mingle and, and uh, interact. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Well, before we dive in a little bit to the deliberate page and all the services you can provide authors, can you just give us a little background on yourself? Um, you know, how long have you been into um, graphic design and editing and all the things that you manage? Um, is this something that you've been doing for a long time? You know, it's um, publishing is something I fell into. I've been a graphic designer for 20, almost 20 years now. Um, and I've run a creative department. I've, you know, I've done all the things in graphic design. And maybe 10 years ago, one of my good friends started to write. And she was writing for a very niche, uh, small publisher. And they did a terrible job with covers and interiors. And so she's, a, she's also a graphic artist and started doing covers. And she brought me in to do the interiors. Um, and it's something I absolutely fell in love with. And I really love the indie world. I love that I have an opportunity to work with authors who maybe don't have the opportunity to, to work with major publishers because they're such gatekeepers. And so I get to be part of putting those voices out into the world. That's great. And, and from the reading side of it, are you coming in as a strong, uh, heavy reader as well? Somebody who consumes a lot yeah. of books? <laughs> oh yeah, I've, I've been a reader my entire life. My dad read The Hobbit to me when I was five. Um, and so it's been, I, I read every night. I'm an avid reader and I'm, I'm not a writer per se. I do write a column for an independent magazine, but for the most part, I'm a reader and a designer. And what do you read? What do you like while we're, while we've got you on this subject? Uh, dystopia. I like dystopian fiction, but I like a lot of things. Um, funny enough, I don't actually read much romance, but, um, across the board, I read everything. That's great. Excellent. So um, your company, The Deliberate Page, the how long has that been around? When did you start that? I started that in 2013 um, and started mostly with fiction and have grown to do a lot more. I, just, I started with just the interior designs, um, but I realized that there's such a, a gap in the space of offering, helping authors figure out publishing. Um, there's just there's so much information, there's a lot of misinformation and trying to figure out how to get your book from written to published is stressful, it's challenging, it's confusing. Um, and so over the years, what I've learned, I've been able to then support authors in getting to that point in the right way, the way that's gonna work best for them. There's just too many damn choices. There are, there are so many and none of them is wrong, but not all of them are right. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that occurs to me, and I've read lots and lots of indie published, which is now a sort of euphemism for self-published, absolutely fine. Um, the thing that occurs to me is I have read some self-published books that are 1000% as good as anything coming out of a big publisher in New York. They are impeccably edited, impeccably produced, and uh, the covers are spiffy. The Everything about the look and feel of it is um, every bit is good, if not in some cases better than the stuff coming out of a big, quote unquote, big publisher. So the standards are there. You, you, it's all within our um, grasp to be able to produce a book at the quality we want to produce it. 
Absolutely. And, and traditional publishers are gatekeepers, you know, they have limited staff budgets, you know, and an exceptional book may not be the thing that is selling, or it might be controversial enough that a publisher doesn't want to touch it. I mean, cancel culture is really a, a big thing. And so it doesn't mean a book isn't worthy or isn't exceptional. Um, and that independent self-publishing route can be ideal. Yeah. So just to give folks an idea, how many books do you think you've edited and or produced in the last nine, 10 years? I was just counting them up. I was updating my website and I have actually worked on um, close to 800 books at this point. Wow. I'm working with close to 200 authors, you know, different series, different types of books um, from fiction to nonfiction and children's books. It's been an exceptional opportunity. Do most people approach you from the editing side or the graphic design side, or are they looking for the whole package? Uh, most people are coming to me for the design side. Um, my clients are almost all referral based. So whether it's coming from other professionals, cover artists, editors, or previous clients. Um, and I, I added editing services a couple of years ago. Um, partially because people, you know, once people reach me, they're sort of ready for that publishing, but I was, recognizing that maybe not all of those books are ready to be published. And so I wanted to add that service to, to really make sure that those books are fully produced before they go, you know, especially when you put out that incredible amount of investment to professionally publish. Um, I wanted to make sure that authors had the opportunity to get everything buttoned up before they published. Yeah. Just to give folks an idea um, in terms of what the timeline might look like if they were to query you, tomorrow. Um, what kind of, I mean, obviously you got the word deliberate in your company name, which is a fabulous choice of words, I must say, in terms of saying, to me, it, sometimes it's just the indie world is just rush, rush, rush. Let's go, go, go. Let's get eight titles out this year, et cetera. You obviously have a little bit more of a careful or at least plotted out approach to getting a book produced. Give us an idea of the timeline. Yeah. So for formatting, I usually recommend about two months. Um, it doesn't necessarily take that long to format a book, um, but there are enough variables that if something doesn't go perfectly, you don't want to be rushing up against that deadline to publish where you might, you know, you might find that you have typos or you realize that um, something, something wasn't right or there's a chapter missing or whatever that is. So if, if you're done two months, you know, if you plan two months before publishing, um, then you, you have that, that extra padding. Um, I, and if you're going to add editing to that, I would add another six weeks, um, because it, you really want everything. You, you don't want to be publishing the day after everything's done. You want to have some time to go through it and make sure it's ready and polished and really exactly what you want. Right. Right. So when you say two months in terms of interior design, that's after you've gone through the copy editing step, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just rough idea on costs, or should we just send, do you have a rate sheet online we should send people to, or is it by the page, by the word? Yeah, so I um, I can give you a rough, so fiction and nonfiction are very different rates. I and mean, if you think about, um, especially for the for the design portion, Nonfiction has bulleted points and subheads, and you know you might have graphs or whatever. Um, my nonfiction typically starts at about seven hundred and fifty dollars um, for fifty thousand words, and it goes up from there. It'll vary depending on your needs. Uh, fiction can start about four fifty, and that's for print and digital. So it'd be your PDF and your eBooks. Well, that sounds really reasonable. Yeah, you know, I um, I really. Publishing is very expensive. To publish well is expensive. And I want to make sure that authors have the opportunity to realize some revenue for their efforts. Um, so I do try and keep my costs manageable. That's great. Wow. Now, do you have people you work with or are you all you're the person? I do all the design work. I do have an editor who does the editing and formatting um, for me. And I worked with her for years and years. Um, and then I have a circle of, of professionals that I refer out for cover art or for legal resources. Um, I, I have a network of people that I really trust and happily refer clients to. That's great. Once, once the book is done, are you more Amazon uh, helping people get on Amazon? Do you go a lightning 
source Ingram Spark approach? Uh, do you care or do you have a preference? It's a really good question because it kind of circles back to an author's goals. Um, there are different reasons to publish on all of those platforms. Um, I've actually been using um, oh, Lulu a lot for some authors recently, which is less common, but has some really good options depending on your goals. And, um, you know, if you want to be on bookshelves, you want to be in, in you want to be publishing with Ingram Spark. If that's not important to you, you can be with KDP or um, you can be with Ingram Spark. You can be with Lulu. There are definitely different options available. And you're agnostic in terms of all that. You'll go whatever direction the client wants to go. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about, you know, an author's goals and their needs. And then we, you know, if we need to redirect, we can. But all of those platforms are very similar in what they're able to produce for you. Um, I don't think one is superior to another in all aspects. Yeah. So what is your process of taking a client through the goal setting uh, part of this and making sure that they understand that there are some decisions about the look and feel of the book that need to be um, considered if they're going to reach the audience they're trying to reach with their book. When we start talking about a book, we I will um, I like to have a conversation with an author. So I try and either get on a Zoom meeting or get on a phone call, and we really take some time to talk about who the book is written for. We want to know the age of the audience. We want to know um, if it's a special niche. You know, if it's nonfiction, is it for your client base or is it for the general public? Um, and then I also want to understand, you know, do you have an audience? Are you are you a new author and you're just starting out and you're trying to gain some traction with your novel writing? Um, are you a small business owner and you are going to be teaching students and this is a textbook for you? Um, are you looking to book speaking engagements? You know, those are all things that will dictate not only how we design a book, but also how you sell a book. Um, so, you know, a younger audience and an older audience, you want font faces that are easy to read. You know, if we have, as we get older, our eyes get tired. We want, you know, larger fonts. We want them to be, you know, we don't want the little tiny letters that are really hard to get through. Um, but if you're writing for, you know, a 20 something audience, those smaller typefaces are fine. Um, so we'll sit down and we talk about your goals. We talk about who you're writing for, how you want to sell your book. Um, what your needs are. If you have color pictures in your books, that's going to help decide where you're going to print your book. Um, so we talk about all of those things. And then and then I work through sample pages for an author. So we talk about what you need, what you like, what you've seen that you really think works great. And we'll put together some sample pages and we'll review it together to make sure that they're meeting your goals. They're going to work well for your audience. And then we go through the full formatting process and proofing. Wow. Oh. How do you keep up with all these? <laughs> there's changes in the industry. There's changes in what's trendy. Um, do you have a way? Do you you must really pay attention to what's happening and also have a way to keep up with all the changes? I'll I'll go on um, Ingram Spark or something, and all of a sudden there's an update in how they do things, or you know, there it's it's. Yeah. A... I am. I'm. You know, I'm a member of several different groups. I'm a member of Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers, um, Colorado Independent Publishing Association. Um, independent Book Publishing Association. They're all excellent um, organizations that really have some solid information. And so I, I keep up to date with those as well. And I also, I, um, as a designer, I tend to lean towards simple. Um, there are, things change all the time. The styles change, the, the trends change. Um, but I, especially in book design or interior design, I think, that keeping it to the basics will always serve you well. So we start with the basics, we make sure that it reads well, that it presents well, and then we can add those embellishments or those, those new things. Um, and eBooks are a little bit more challenging because they do change a lot and what's capable changes a lot. But as long as we're keeping it simple and readable, that's really the goal because the goal is to be read. It's not to be looked at, right? Right, right. Um, all right. So let's, let's talk quickly about eBooks real quick. Um, and maybe yeah. real quick. I don't know, it might, might take an hour. I don't know. Um, but, um, what is your preferred method these days on eBook production? And let's say I want to do 
KDP. I want to go Amazon world with my ebook only. I don't mm -hmm. want to, I don't care about all the other different formats out there. Just, just Kindle. Where do you, how do you produce that ebook? What do you use the software? Do you use Kindle creates? Do you use something else? Yeah. So I, I use InDesign. InDesign is my primary software for both print and digital. Um, but you cannot export. Well, you can export directly from InDesign to um, an EPUB format. Right. But there are some things that you still need to adjust. So I, personally, I, I export from InDesign and then I go in and I edit the code. Um, but there are some fantastic um, software resources out there. And in fact, even if you are only publishing on, say, Kindle, draft to digital, um, you can upload your manuscript there, you can format it and export the EPUB, and you can use an EPUB for Kindle as well. That is one of the recent changes. Um, Kindle or KDP will now accept EPUB files. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to, you know, there's, uh, Oh my goodness, I can't remember what it is right now. Vellum, if you are on a Mac yeah. platform, yeah. Um, is a great software. It produces some really beautiful books. Um, Calibri, a lot of people are using Calibri. I think if you have some foundational knowledge about how ebooks work, you can use a lot of different platforms. Um, and primarily, the foundational knowledge is really understanding that ebooks render the visual effects using styles. So if you have applied styles to all of your text, and you can do that in Word, and you can do that in any, really any software, right? Um, if you apply those styles and they're consistent, then your book should render pretty well. Can you play every instrument in the orchestra? <laughs> Not all of them. No. <laughs> Good, great. Um, you really the, the foundational information, it really will take you where you need to be on most pieces yeah. of the software. Yeah. Wow. All right. So one of the big things that happens is if you're in, uh, you're a writer, you're finishing your book and you now you want to get it published is you start going online and you start poking around on social media or you enter a bunch of questions in Google and there is advice will come at you from a hundred different directions and you'll see conflicting information. You'll see competing information. And um, as you know, within about 10 minutes, you can be as lost and your, your head will be bloody from scratching it and wanting to know what's the right way to go. How do you advise, you know, clients to sort through all of that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I think, so, you know, um, Colorado Independent Publishers Association, Ally, uh, IBPA, those are all excellent organizations that have really solid information about professional publishing. And I would use those resources first. Um, but you're going to go out and you're going to be on Facebook. You'll ask a question, you'll get a dozen different answers. Um, some of that is trying to understand who the person, you know, who the person might be, what their experience is, but it's not always going to give you the information that you need. One of the things that I tell my authors to actually go out and do is when they get that advice to go out and look at traditionally published books. Something I see all the time is don't use hyphenation. Well, hyphenation is super important and it's an industry standard and it really makes reading much smoother than not using it. So if you go and you look at, at you know, if you look at Stephen King's latest book, you'll see hyphenation on every page. That's something that happens. Um, so double checking with really the industry standards, going back and double checking to make sure things are consistent with what you're seeing traditional publishers publish is a good way to double check. Um, and then looking at uh, the experience of somebody who's making recommendations, if if it's an independent author who um, has maybe just published one book and they're very proud of what they've done, that's wonderful. And there's there's nothing to um, to shame in that. But if they don't have any experience in the industry, maybe a device that you need to have validated through other resources, through professional resources. But it's challenging trying yeah. to trying to get the right answer, and not all answers are the right answer for all authors. Right, right. And so it sounds to me like you know you rather than maybe getting if you you run into some advice online and it's one person who's lobbying out some some of their personal experience and just putting it out there as the gold standard, 
you might compare that against going to an organization that's got a whole bunch of writers like Colorado Independent Publishers Association or any other group that um, where it's more of a gathered and a curated set of current advice and standards. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, that's not to say that you shouldn't break rules. I'm a, a big fan of breaking rules, but I also, I think it's valuable to understand what the rules are and then have a good reason for breaking them. You know, yeah. if you decide that you want to use Comic Sans in your book and you have a good reason for using it, use it, you know, it's probably not going to be the advice that you get from somebody, but if you have a good reason, it makes sense for what you're doing, do it. Yeah. Just do it with purpose. What's your, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but do you have any success stories you'd like to point to? Like a author who came in the door kind of modestly and you helped shape their book into something really spiffy and it's already sold X thousand numbers of copies or anything? Um, I've worked with, you know, I've worked with a few big best-selling romance authors who, when they, when I started working with them, were pretty small. Um, Laura Pavlov um, has just, she's reached the New York Times bestseller list and she's become very prolific. Um, Shoban Davis, I, I worked with her for several years um, on her series and those have been really joyful to really watch the, those, those authors grow and succeed. Um, and I am I'm just a small part of what they have done. I, you know, I help polish it up, but they have done an exceptional job and I'm happy to have been part of their teams. And they, they're, you're still working with them. I'm not still working with them. At, at some point, some of these authors get big enough and prolific enough that they're producing enough books that they hire, they hire somebody in house and it's, um, it makes absolute sense for what they're doing, but I was happy to be part of that journey and getting them to that point. That must be bittersweet to see them go. It is, but I like seeing how well they're doing. I, I like to see authors succeed. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Wow. New York Times, that must feel excellent to know that you were a part of their um, journey and getting them there. Yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about covers. Um, there, you, you know, a lot of times an author will have a pretty strong idea of what they might want coming in. And sometimes I assume they have no idea or they have 10 different ideas. But the key is, um, you know, the reader experience, I guess. Is that is that right? You're you're you're, yeah. you're establishing so much expectation. The, the cover communicates so much about what audience it's for, um, about what the overall reading experience might feel like. Talk to us about how you approach that uh, that conversation and and also how much say you give your authors in terms of final input. Yeah, I mean, at, well, at the end of the day, it is always an author's choice. That's self-publishing, right? You have control. You get to decide what you want to do. Um, but we do talk a lot about um, who is your audience and meeting expectations. If you have, you know, a really dark, moody cover, but it's a, you know, it's a cozy romance, it's probably not going to appeal to the audience that you're looking for. Or, I'm sorry, cozy mystery. Um, so really, and it's true with everything, setting expectations is a big deal. If you have a cover that doesn't speak to what the book is about or the mood um, it, and the author or a reader buys your book based on that cover, they're likely to be disappointed, um, you know, because it's not what they were expecting. And that's when you start getting bad reviews and bad reviews have an impact. Um, so we do talk about, you know, uh, you know, when authors come to me, I actually have them fill out a form that includes things like what what mood, what aesthetic do you want to see in this? What what represents your book? And then we design based on that. Um, aesthetic really lends to an experience. So, it, um, I try and help authors really kind of flesh out what they. We have conversations, right? We flesh out what their goal is, and then we take their ideas. And maybe those will change a lot. You know, what, what you think you want and what really will work might change, but we have those conversations. Well, what if, you know, what if we, instead of, you know, having elements of the entire story, what if we just take this one piece that really um, 
that really embodies everything and the details fill themselves in as an author reads, but we're not, um, we're not trying to tell the whole story on the front cover. Right, right. There's a, there's an advantage of being clean and paring things down. Yeah, you know, they say a design is finished when you can't take anything else away. Yeah. That's so. like, wow. I actually hadn't heard that line. That's interesting. Is yeah. It, yeah. That's great. Hmm. Interesting. Very cool. So you must walk into a bookstore with a whole set of different eyes than the average Joe. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I do. I'll pick up a book and I look. I'll look at all of the elements before I really look at it. I'm drawn by the cover, don't get me wrong. I'm usually picking up a, a book by the cover, but I'll yeah. pick it up and I'll flip through it and, and kind of analyze how it's produced before I spend a lot of time looking at what the subject is. So when you read a book, can you actually read and get lost in the story or are your eyes always sort of being critical and analytical of the design choices? That's an interesting um, kind of topic. I I think that when a book is well designed, you don't see the formatting; it just disappears. And so, absolutely, when a well designed book, I get lost in the story, which is really the goal, right? Um, and that's why interior design is so important because you don't really want it to stand out; you don't want it to draw attention to itself. So, absolutely, a good a good book, it's well designed. I get lost in all the time. That's great. Well, as we kind of wrap up here, a couple more questions. And one is, um, you know, have all the with all the experience you've had with authors coming to you, some 200 or more than that, you must have in your mind um, a sort of checklist that either you'd like to have those writers before they come to you, you know, what can they do to be prepared to be successful? And what, with all your experience and seeing some books go to the New York Times or some writers you've helped get to the New York Times bestseller list and others who really, you know, they put a lot of money and effort into it, but it just didn't go anywhere, you know? Um, yeah. What, we, what separates the wheat from the chaff? Um, I think the biggest thing, having a professionally or published, professionally produced book is important, but you really have to have marketing in mind you really have to understand where you want to sell your book and how you want to sell it and you have to be planning for that well in advance um you know after you write the end and, and after everything's ready isn't the time to start it's really months or even a year in advance um finding a community where you think your book is going to resonate whether it's online on facebook or it's book talk or it's bookstagram um building that audience is really important. And then having some barriers, having people read your book to make sure it makes sense, um, that it's not going to confuse people. Um, so there's a lot of prep work even after the book is written. So coming with those things in mind, you know, where you're selling it, because that's gonna dictate a little bit of how we design it and where you're producing it. Um, and the kind of capital that you have to come up with. If, you're, if your goal is to sell direct, you know, if you don't want to get involved in social media, I worked with a wonderful author out of Florida who absolutely hates social media. She's not going to do it, but she wrote this incredibly beautiful um, middle grade book, had it professionally illustrated. It's wonderful. Um, but her goal is to work with um, she lives in a touristy area and the book is written about that area. And so she wants to work with um, a lot of the gift shops in, in the area, and she's going to sell her book direct there. But that means purchasing the book um, in bulk, you know, wholesale oh. upfront and establishing those relationships so that she can be successful. So marketing, I think, is the biggest thing, e even before the book is completed. Yeah. It's going to be the biggest piece. Yeah. But Deliver a Page doesn't do anything with marketing, or do you? We don't do anything with marketing specifically, but we do um, we do talk about ways to where you where you anticipate selling your book and and making sure that you're set up to do that effectively. Yeah, excellent. And back on the point about confusing stories, when you're in the process of editing something, do you occasionally 
write back to the author who's wanting a copy edit and say, you know, you're not even ready for a copy edit because I can't follow this story? Yeah, I don't do the editing directly, but my my editor does. It's we actually take some time to review a manuscript before we commit to any editing uh -huh. um, to really get an idea of, of both so that the author has the opportunity to see how we work and, and the process that we use and make sure that it works for them, because not all not all systems are the same, um, but also to really get an understanding of where the manuscript is and the kind of editing that it needs. Yeah. Um, and then we'll be able to better provide that full-scale support. Yeah. So if I wanted to engage you now, if I were needing your services, how many months out are you from being able to take me on based on your current caseload? Um, I do have time coming up in January. So my schedule starts to fill up in January. December and November are always slow because everybody likes to get their books done ahead of time. Um, but, you know, if you know your book is going to be done in the next month or so, get in touch so that I can make sure that we can get you into the calendar. Great. And finally, just uh, I have, I have the, the usual closing question, which is going to be to ask you to recommend a book or a writer. So you have a few minutes to think about that while I ask you this next question. Uh, but um, looking back, you know, what does this mean to you personally to have helped bring so many stories out into the world and what is it uh how does it feel to you to help to know that you've helped so many authors this is um i left my corporate job to do this because i felt like this was a way to give back to put good things back into the world i think traditional publishing is fantastic for some authors but there are so many voices that don't get heard in that arena and so being able to help amplify and really give authors a voice in a really polished professional way so they can be heard has been exceptionally satisfying and from all walks of life. You know, I work with BIPOC authors. I like work with, you know, LGBTQ authors. I work with, it, it's across the board. Um, and that's really satisfying for me. Which makes me think you probably are watching the Supreme Court case that's um, just getting, just got heard this week. Yeah, a little bit. I haven't been following it too closely. Well, just the whole issue of whether uh, somebody in your shoes, and this was a website designer, I believe, can turn away a client if you're designing, if you're got a, if you're hanging out a shingle and saying you're open for business, can you decide who your customers are are based on their, in this case, um, sexual orientation? So, yeah. Yeah, it's a tough it's a tough topic for a lot of people, but um, you're you're welcome. Your doors are wide open. They are, absolutely. That's great. Okay, final question is to recommend maybe a recent book or all-time favorite book, some of maybe a title that more people should pay attention to, something that you really, um, really love. Yeah, um, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, my niece and nephew have really gotten into reading over the last year. So we spent all last evening talking about books. Um, and I just read the Song of Achilles, um, but it was it was a very touching book, and it was I I actually listened to the audio book, um, but a really sweet relationship between Achilles and and Patrick his partner, um, well worth reading. Great, excellent. Well, Tamara Cribbly, thank you so much for your time today and jumping on the podcast, and um, this has been a great. Um, Great rundown of uh, information and insights. So we really appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.